Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. We begin tonight with Apple. Their latest phones and gadgets have been unveiled. They're betting big on AI, but the technology is not original and it's not even ready. So is the iPhone 16 worth your money? How did the markets react to the big launch? And can artificial intelligence save Apple? We'll discuss all of that. In Bangladesh, more cases are piling against Sheikh Hasina and Dhaka is all set to seek her extradition from India. What will New Delhi do? In Europe, they face some tough choices to reverse their economic decline, either get 800 billion euros every year or be prepared for slow agony. In the US, both Trump and Biden are pushing for a sovereign wealth fund, but top billionaires and advisors say the idea is stupid. We'll tell you why. Also counting down to the presidential debate between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, we'll tell you what to expect tonight. A look at how the, the news media business is evolving and how consumers are moving online. Is ecocide or the deliberate damage to environment the same as genocide? We'll tell you which countries want it to be declared as an international crime and why. How Elon Musk is set to become the world's first trillionaire by 2027. Why banning children from social media may not really work and why Saturn is set to lose its rings. All this and more coming up, the headlines first. An Israeli strike on a humanitarian zone in Gaza kills at least 40 people. Israel says the target was a Hamas command center in the area. It claims to have killed several Hamas members involved in the October 7th massacre. Turkey calls the strike a war crime. This comes as a Gaza truce deal remains elusive. Jordanians vote in a parliamentary election overshadowed by the war in Gaza. It was also the first vote since the 2022 reforms, which increased the number of seats in the House, reserving more for women. The minimum age for candidates was also lowered. A slump in tourism, a sector vital to Jordan's economy, is another big factor in this election. In India, curfew imposed in three districts in Manipur. Mobile internet and broadband services also banned for five days. This comes after a fresh spurt of violence and protests. In the last 10 days, at least eight people have been killed in ethnic clashes. The northeastern state has been rocked by periodic violence for more than a year now. The UK releases thousands of prisoners to ease overcrowding in jails. The prison population in England and Wales is at its highest ever level. No violent offenders or domestic abusers are eligible for early release. Recently, convicted criminals have been spared jail sentences due to a lack of space. And the former partner and attacker of Ugandan runner Rebecca Cheptegi dies due to his injuries. He had poured petrol over the Olympic athlete. The mother of two had sustained 80% burns and died last week. Cheptegi will be buried this Saturday near her family home in Uganda. Hey Siri, who is the architect behind the museum of... Wait, no, not the museum. The Palace of Fine Arts. It's September, which can only mean one thing. Apple has launched its new lineup of gadgets, a new iPhone, new AirPods, and new Apple Watches. As always, the focus was on the phone. What would the iPhone 16 look like? It mostly looks like the old one, except for an extra button on the side, a camera button. You can use it to control features on your phone camera, like zooming in and out. But the big change is inside the phone. iPhone 16 comes with a brand new processing chip, the A18 Pro. It is meant for Apple's next big thing, Apple Intelligence, basically their version of AI. Apple is integrating ChatGPT into the voice assistant Siri. AI will help you write. 
help you create emojis, and of course search for things online, but Apple intelligence won't roll out immediately. They will debut in the US in October, and then gradually other markets will get, will get it. Now most of these AI features are not ready yet. You may have to wait until next year, perhaps even later. So Apple has basically unveiled a half-baked product. Their whole marketing pitch is trust us. Imagine if someone else had done this. Not just unveiled an unfinished product, but also charged you more money for it. You would never think about buying it. So why treat Apple differently? And we understand their desperation. iPhones make up nearly half of Apple's sales. But iPhone purchases are down. Look at the period from January to March. iPhone sales were 10% down compared to the year before. So Apple needs people to buy their phones again. And that's why they're betting on AI. The question is, will it work? Well, the new iPhone starts at $799. In India, it's more expensive. The base model is around 80,000 rupees. It goes all the way up to 1,84,000 rupees. And what do you get for this money? An iPhone 15 with an extra button. But with Apple, price has rarely affected sales. So the proof is in the market. Having said that, a couple of things have become clear. Number one, Apple is clearly running out of ideas. I mean, they pioneered smartphone technology, stuff like touchscreens and good quality cameras, features that made phones genuinely better. But we haven't seen that in a while. The changes now are incremental and basically more of the same. Slightly better cameras, maybe a new body case or longer battery life. These are not innovations. These are expected from any company. Which brings us to the second point. Apple is too late to the AI game. Google and Samsung have already done it. Their phones have integrated artificial intelligence, so Apple is not really ahead of the curve. They are behind it. In fact, Samsung is openly mocking Apple. Look at their tweets today. This is what they've been saying. Let us know when it falls. We may have set your AI expectations too high. Frankly, they've got a point. Samsung has a lot more than just AI. Their phones can flip and fold. Huawei too has joined the craze. Yesterday they unveiled a tri-fold phone, a phone that can fold thrice. Huawei claims they've got more than 3 million orders already. Do you see the problem here? A, Apple is late to the trend, and B, it is more expensive than others. So why would people buy an iPhone 16? Honestly, I'm not convinced that, you know, the capabilities that they introduce is going to drive that many people to upgrade. And, you know, the other problem, of course, is all of the initial AI models are U.S. English only. So that cuts out, you know, a decent portion of the world. And some of this stuff won't come until next year for other regions around the world and other languages. And the markets agree. Apple shares closed flat on Monday. There was no cheer despite the launch, and this is not about just one product. It's a make or break moment for Apple because the company has shown its hand. They had plans to diversify into cars. That has been dumped. They unveiled a virtual reality headset last year. Again, hasn't really worked. And most importantly, the iPhone sales are down. Samsung now has a 20% market share. Apple is down to 17%, and it's clear why. Others already offer what Apple is promising. Just look at Samsung's Galaxy phones. They offer you real-time translations, AI-powered photo editing, and writing and text summarization. Apple is not offering any of this. So why would customers buy an iPhone 16? There used to be a time when phones, iPhones, were better than everything else on the market. But that, unfortunately, is not the case anymore. iPhones are lagging behind in features and technology, which is why this AI bet is do or die. Apple has spent around $100 billion on research and development. Presumably, that includes AI. But the company does not have its own AI model, nor does it plan on making one. Instead, Apple is using third-party models like ChatGPT and Google AI. The problem with that? It's not exclusive. Google AI powers Google's phones as well, so AI models alone are not enough. Apple needs to find the touch screen of AI, something that, that users will be immediately attracted to, something that makes their experience easier. And if they can't? Well, right now, Apple is too big to fail. The company is worth more than $3.3 trillion, plus their products have a loyal fan base. Innovation or not, people will buy Apple for other things, like a better touch interface or a better gadget ecosystem. So it's hard to imagine Apple going bust like BlackBerry or Nokia. 
But not going bust is a low bar to set, especially for a brand like Apple. They once dominated the smartphone market globally, so anything less is a major loss. Meanwhile, more trouble is brewing for Sheikh Hasina. Calls for her extradition are getting louder. Criminal cases against her are piling up. And this could put India in a spot. The latest demand has come from Bangladesh's War Crimes Tribunal. I'm talking about the International Crimes Tribunal set up by Sheikh Hasina herself in 2010. It was meant to investigate the atrocities during the 1971 war. Now, 14 years later, the same tribunal is investigating Sheikh Hasina. She's been accused of overseeing massacres. The tribunal's chief prosecutor spoke to reporters on Sunday. Let me quote from what he said. As the main perpetrator has fled the country, we will start the legal procedure to bring her back. Needless to say, the main perpetrator here is Sheikh Hasina. Mohammed Yunus holds the same view. He's the caretaker leader of Bangladesh. Last week, he spoke about Hasina, and he said that Bangladesh will ask for her extradition. In fact, listen to the exact quote. If India wants to keep her until the time Bangladesh wants her back, the condition would be that she has to keep quiet. That's what he said. Hasina's main political rival, the BNP, is making the same demand. That's the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, BNP, the party of Khalid Azia. They want India to extradite her. And that is largely the mood in Bangladesh. There is widespread public anger against Hasina, and that puts more pressure on the interim government to ask New Delhi for her return. Meanwhile, her party leaders are facing a crackdown. Dozens of them have been arrested. At least 14 ministers and lawmakers are facing a travel ban. Many more are on the run. At least one of them was arrested near the Indian border. This leader was trying to flee to India. So a formal request from Dhaka for Hasina's extradition is just a matter of time. Sheikh Hasina has more than 100 cases against her. At least 63 of these are murder charges. The others involve serious, serious crimes like widespread human rights abuses, mass detentions, and extrajudicial killing of political opponents. Now, Bangladesh has an extradition treaty with India, one that Hasina herself had signed in 2013. Dhaka could use this treaty to seek her extradition in any of these criminal cases. Her diplomatic passport was revoked soon after she left. And this leaves Hasina with limited options. She is still in India. She landed here on the 5th of August. So it's been more than a month now. There is little information about her current status. Reports say she's staying in a safe house at an undisclosed location. Her asylum requests seem to be stuck in a limbo. Soon after she fled Bangladesh, Hasina is believed to have reached out to multiple countries to the, like the US, the UK, the UAE, but no luck so far. Reports say negotiations are still on and Hasina would only make a formal application if there is a guarantee that it will be approved. Until then, she has no choice but to stay put. And time is not on her side. There, is, there, is visible, there are visible signs of strain between New Delhi and Dhaka. The latest move is this one, an export ban slapped by Bangladesh, targeting a specific kind of fish, the Padma Hilsa. It's an integral part of Bengali cuisine. And the ban also comes just ahead of Durga Puja, arguably the biggest festival in Bengal. The Padma Hilsa is widely prepared during Durga Puja, but reports say that Bangladesh has decided not to supply the fish just ahead of the festival. And what's the reason? Dhaka says there is a supply shortage. Now, to be fair, such restrictions have been imposed before, but under Sheikh Hasina, exceptions were always made for India. That is not happening now. The relationship is not the same. Bangladesh seems to be distancing itself from India. Sheikh Hasina has become political kryptonite. Her legal battles and her political legacy have put India in a tricky spot. 
Hasina was instrumental in cementing ties between Dhaka and Delhi. Now she has become the biggest obstacle towards normalization of the same ties. Our next story is about Europe. Once upon a time, it was the world's economic powerhouse. Now it is an aging giant, staring at decline and slow agony. I'm not the one saying this. These are the words of Mario Draghi, the former Prime Minister of Italy and a former President of the European Central Bank. Last year, Draghi was asked to compile a report on the future of European competitiveness. It was to be a roadmap for the future to help the European Union dig itself out of its economic hole. You see, the EU has been on the decline. It peaked during the last century, but now it keeps facing one crisis after another. The continent as a whole is aging. They're losing their competitive edge. Once indomitable industries like the German automobile empire are slowly crumbling. And there are no new European giants to take their place. No European startup has crossed the 100 billion euro mark in 50 years. 30% of the EU's unicorns, the startups valued at over $1 billion, they're called unicorns. 30% of EU unicorns have left the block since 2008. So it's a dire situation. And that is why Mario Draghi was stabbed last year. He was asked to find a solution to this mess. And yesterday, his report finally came out. Now, we... We have said many times that growth has been slowing down for a long time in Europe. But we've ignored it. Now conditions have changed. World trade is slowing. China is actually slowing very much, but it's become much less open to us. And actually it's competing with us in global markets on all accounts. We've lost our main supplier of cheap energy, Russia. And now we have to start for our defense again for the first time since the world, since the Second World War. The investment needs that all this entails are massive. The investment share will have to rise by around five percentage points of GDP to levels last seen in the 60s and the 70s. Draghi wants the EU to increase investments by about 750 to 800 billion euros every single year. Let me repeat that, 800 billion euros every year. This is what it will cost to reverse Europe's decline. Let's pause for a moment. Let's forget about where this money will come from. That's a lot of money. Let's say the EU manages to find the sum. Then what? Will all their problems magically go away? Probably not, because the EU's problem is not just the money. They're already wealthier than everyone else, except for China and the US. The problem goes deeper. Europe is still stuck in the last century. It failed to capitalize on the digital revolution. It hung on to its old manufacturing roots. But now the world is moving forwards, and Europe's old industries are becoming obsolete. They're being overrun by cheaper, modern alternatives, like Chinese electric vehicles, which are crippling European automobiles. Along with an outdated economy, Europe also has an aging population. It's the oldest continent in the world. The average age there is 42. In Europe, the average age is 42. Asia's average age is about 31. Same with South America. In Africa, the average age is barely 19. So who will be able to work more? Who will end up being more productive? Europe has managed to paper over the cracks so far because of its enormous head start. But now even that is not enough. The playing field is getting leveled and Europe's age is starting to show. Now combine this with the constant squabbling. There are 22, 27 EU member countries. 27 countries are members of the European Union. Only 20 of them use the common currency, the euro. Then you have members like Hungary, led by Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who keeps trying to thwart Europe's unified front. Richer countries like Germany are wary about joint projects. They don't want to foot another nation's bill. Amid all these squabbles, how will Europe get its act together? How will it come together to save itself? The simple answer is, it probably won't. Europe's decline is well underway, and the EU seems powerless to stop it. So as Draghi said, the people there should prepare for quote-unquote slow agony. 
So Europe is debating its economic future. The U.S. is doing the same. And the point of discussion here is this. Should America have a sovereign wealth fund? For a change, both Biden and Trump seem to agree. They believe it's time for the U.S. to have its own fund. And this is more than just a campaign promise. Donald Trump mentioned it during a recent campaign event. Meanwhile, Joe Biden's team has been working on it for some time. And this is the man in charge, America's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan. Reports say he's been working on a plan for months now. Sullivan has been meeting with economic experts. They've had substantive debates on what should be the size of this fund. How will it be run? What will its leadership look like? All these questions are being discussed. But the most important one is this. Why does America feel the need for such a fund? And what will the U.S. use it for? They're yet to fully spell out their plan. Apparently, the goal is to not amass more wealth. It's about mobilizing funds to secure strategic assets. That's what this fund aims to do. Which brings us to the next question. What are strategic assets? Well, think of them as vital organs of the human body, like the brain, lungs, kidneys, the heart. Without them, no human can survive. Now think of a country as a body. Its strategic assets are like these vital organs, something that the country cannot function without. They cover a wide range of sectors, from basic resources like oil supplies to advanced technologies like space satellites. They also include natural resources, telecom networks, defense companies. All these are vital industries. If they fail, an entire country could, could come to a standstill, which is why they're classified as strategic. The American fund, the sovereign wealth fund that they're talking about, would aim to invest in such areas with a specific focus on national security. This could mean building ships, or investing in new energy projects, stuff like geothermal or nuclear fusion projects. This fund could also be deployed for strategic stockpiles. Say America needs to build a reserve of rare earths. It could use the sovereign wealth fund to secure them. And this is not a new idea. A lot of countries do it. China has been doing it for a while. They too have a sovereign wealth fund. It's called China Investment Corporation. Using this vehicle, Beijing has invested in natural resources. The fund manages some of China's foreign exchanges so that funding is not an issue. Same with Saudi Arabia. They have what is called the Public Investment Fund. It has over $900 billion in management. The kingdom runs these funds using oil money, and the Saudis too, too use this fund for strategic needs, like the Saudi Vision 2030 the brainchild of their crown prince Mohammed bin Salman, a grand plan to transform the Saudi economy, to transition away from oil revenues and towards a more diversified economy. They're working on this transition. And the Public Investment Fund, PIF, is footing the bill for it. So far, it has invested heavily in areas like telecom, aerospace, energy, and green technologies. Again, these sectors are vital for economic security. Now, America wants a similar fund to make strategic bets, and it's a good idea. But can the U.S. afford this fund? Does it have the money? Unlike the oil-rich kingdoms of West Asia, Washington is not sitting on a budget surplus. It owes more than $35 trillion. That's the debt on the U.S. government, $35 trillion. So where will they get more money to fund this initiative? Donald Trump says he wants to raise tariffs on imports. And that excess money from the tariffs would be used for the Sovereign Wealth Fund. But then he's also promising tax cuts for people on the back of those same import duty hikes. As for Team Biden, they don't have a plan yet. Reports say they're considering various models like raising money from a pool of investors. Fundamentally, it all comes down to this. Should the U.S. focus on paying its debt or should it take more financial risk by launching a sovereign wealth fund? That is the core question. Billionaires like Mark Cuban are against the idea of a wealth fund. He's called it stupid. In fact, I have his quote with me. I hate the idea of a sovereign wealth fund. If the government had a surplus, maybe with a deficit, it makes no sense at all. Jared Bernstein is also wary of this idea. He chairs Joe Biden's Council of Economic Advisers, and he's not on board with this one. So the idea already faces resistance. Reports say Biden's team is keen on finalizing this proposal before his term expires. Well, they have their task cut out. 
Our next story concerns the U.S. In a few hours from now, there will be a showdown. Kamala Harris versus Donald Trump, the two presidential candidates will take to the debate stage for the first and possibly the last time. No other debates have been confirmed yet, so it's make or break, mostly for Kamala Harris. Donald Trump knows what he's doing. During his last debate, he had demolished Joe Biden. America's incumbent president did not stand a chance. It was so bad that Biden had to end his re-election bid, paving the way for the rise of Kamala Harris. Now things have come full circle. It's Trump versus Biden's successor, and Trump is preparing for another demolition job. He knows his strengths. More importantly, he knows Harris's weaknesses. So his team has already launched their attack. Our next report has the details. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Donald Trump is facing off against Kamala Harris. The former U.S. president will take on the incumbent vice president. Vice president of the United States of America, Kamala Harris. They will have possibly their only televised debate. So the stakes are high. Both candidates are looking to land a knockout blow. Trump seems ready. His campaign has launched a new line of attack. A ridiculous attack, but one that could serve them well. It involves the city of Springfield, in the state of Ohio. Trump put up this post a few hours ago. He called Springfield the epicenter of the migrant crisis in middle America. Migration is a key electoral issue. It's an issue that Trump and his Republican Party keep raising. They blame Biden, Harris and the Democrats for a surge in illegal immigration to the US. But why Springfield, Ohio? a city of about 60,000 people. Why is it suddenly in the spotlight? Well, here's a post from J.D. Vance, Trump's running mate. He claims that illegal Haitian immigrants are abducting and then eating people's pets in Springfield. Now, to be clear, this has not been proven. There are no verified reports of this taking place. It could be a misunderstanding, based on a similar report from elsewhere in Ohio, or it could be an outright lie. But that hasn't mattered to the Republicans. They are capitalizing on this, because the story is going viral. The shocking claims have caught America's attention, and the Republicans are riding that wave. The story has been called baseless and a racist conspiracy theory, but that doesn't matter to the Republicans because all of America is talking about it, and therefore, talking about illegal immigration. That's exactly what Trump and his team want. They want the focus to be on things like migration and crime. The Republicans do well on these topics. These are the issues that get them votes. So expect them to be major talking points at the debate. Migration and crime will be Trump's line of attack. The Springfield story just got the ball rolling. So, what else can we expect besides immigration and crime? Another major issue is the economy. It's another area where the Republicans have an edge, because Biden has been blamed for America's recent cost-of-living crisis. Harris keeps trying to distance herself from that economic record. She says she will turn the economy around. But that's a hard sell, considering that she's the sitting vice president. These are the topics that will trip Kamala Harris up, the ones Trump will focus on. Harris has to be ready to face the heat. If she's caught off guard, well, we know what happened last time. The last debate cost Joe Biden his re-election bid. It's the reason behind Harris's rise. But if she isn't careful, this debate could lead to her fall. Where do you get your news from? A newspaper, a TV channel, or somewhere online? A few decades ago, the answer was clear, TV or radio or papers. If you wanted news, those were your only sources. But now you're spoiled for choice. You get news on WhatsApp, on YouTube, on X, even on Facebook and Instagram. It's a generational change in consumption patterns. Look at this new report in the UK. Around 71% adults consume news online. Around 70% also consume news on television. So more people get their news online. And this has never happened in the UK. 
TV had always been the number one source of news. So what has changed now? The report says social media is a big factor. Around 52% of British adults use it. Social media, 52% British adults. That's up from 47% last year. So more people are using social media. They're spending more time on social media. As a result, they're reading news on X or Instagram or other such platforms. There's an age difference too. Nine out of 10 young Britons consume news on social media. But among people over 55 years of age, it's the opposite. 90% of them watch the news on TV. But they all agree on one thing. TV news is more trustworthy than online news. And this trend is not limited to the UK. Look at the situation in India. 71% Indians prefer to get their news online. 49% rely on social media. But is this necessarily a good thing? Well, online news does have its advantages. For starters, it's instant. You get real-time updates on various events. That's not always possible on TV. Secondly, it's more accessible. You don't need a TV and cable connection to get the news. All you need is a mobile phone. Again, let's look at India. India's TV penetration is 70%. India's smartphone plus internet penetration is 88%. A third advantage is customization. On TV, you can't choose your content. You must see what the channel is offering. But on the internet, you have options. Say you're looking for news on Manipur. You don't have to see the whole show. You can just click on videos or articles about Manipur. So for consumers, online news is a good deal, which is why more people are using it. But for creators and journalists, it's a little more complicated. Earlier news agencies faced a big challenge in distribution. TV channels needed satellite rights, newspapers needed big printing presses and local distributors. So the costs were pretty high. Not everyone could produce news content. But technology has changed that. It costs nothing to distribute your content on YouTube or X. All you need is an account. But making your content popular and watched is a different ballgame. For that, you're at the mercy of technology, whether it's acing the algorithm or using targeted advertisements or riding the current trends. What's worse, it is all managed by big tech companies, the likes of Google, YouTube, X, and Meta. They basically control the news distribution pipeline. Just consider X. It is owned by Elon Musk, a businessman who's also endorsed Donald Trump for president. Now, what is stopping Musk from suppressing negative Trump content or boosting negative Kamala Harris content or removing content about countries that he's invested in? What's stopping him? Nothing. So online news may have a lot of positives, but transparency and trust are not on that list. These platforms are run by two kinds of people. One, who don't understand the news, and second, who think they do, but don't, like Elon Musk. So the internet has not really demo democratized the news, but it has made it faster and more accessible. Maybe that's why the negatives are less talked about, like fake news. Look at this report from 2018. It found that fake news travels faster than real news on X. That's incentive for miscreants, incentive to peddle unverified information. Another problem is shorter attention spans. People want their news in a couple of lines or maybe a one minute video. Even we make shorter reels of our longer stories. We do that. But you know the problem that we face, giving context explaining why something is happening. So online news may be creating more news consumers, but not all of them are well informed, unfortunately. Of course, such challenges come with any new technology and they, the key is to keep improving. There is no point denying the rise of online news. Our focus should be on making it better. For our next story, let's talk about a new crime, ecocide. What does it mean? It basically stands for deliberately trying to damage the environment, just like genocide, but for the environment. Now, three countries want ecocide to be an international crime, Vanuatu, Fiji, and Samoa. These are small Pacific islands, but they have taken a big step. They have submitted a proposal to the ICC, that's the International Criminal Court. If the court agrees, ecocide, like genocide, will become an international crime in the coming days. But will it change anything? Our next report tells you. It was the thick of the Vietnam War. Amid all the fighting, America dropped a silent killer, Agent Orange. 
It was a powerful herbicide and the US released 20 million gallons of it. They used it to clear crops and forest cover to expose the Vietnamese troops. What they didn't expect was the devastating effects, not just on their enemy, but also on their own soldiers. Agent Orange contained dioxin, one of the deadliest chemicals known to man. Those exposed to it suffered for years. But it also left its mark on the planet. Forests were scorched and ecosystems were destroyed. So in 1970, American biologist Arthur Galston coined a term to define this destruction. It was called ecocide. So what does ecocide exactly mean? The term refers to any act that can cause damage to the ecosystem. Now, it can be anything. Let's say a huge oil spill or deforestation or even using toxic chemicals. If it deliberately harms the environment, it is ecocide. So is it recognized as a crime? Currently, ecocide is a crime in over 12 countries. This includes Belgium, which criminalized it this year. The punishment is up to 20 years in prison and damages worth $1.8 million. In Russia and Ukraine too, it's a crime. Similar bills are in the works in Brazil and Mexico. Which brings us to Vanuatu, Fiji and Samoa. These are low-lying island nations in the Pacific. The rising sea levels are a threat to their existence. If it continues like this, these countries will be underwater in the future which is why they have asked for radical change. They want the International Criminal Court to define ecocide as an international crime. That means it would have the same status as genocide or war crimes. But is ecocide on par with genocide? Well, some argue that it is. They say while genocide targets a people, ecocide targets the planet itself. Genocide and ecocide share a common element, that is, intent. Both are deliberate acts meant to destroy, which is why there's a push to recognize it as an international crime. Which brings us to the ICC itself. It was set up to deal with genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. In 2010, it added crimes of aggression to the list. So adding ecocide wouldn't be unprecedented. Right now, 120 countries are party to the ICC which means it would create guardrails for the world. But will the world's biggest powers recognize it? Look at some of the world's biggest polluters, China and the United States. They're not even part of the ICC. Plus, it's likely that they will try to challenge the court's ruling. Also, countries already flout ICC rules on war crimes and genocide. Why will they toe their line on ecocide? Nonetheless, the move is a significant one and it shows the shifting tide of public opinion. A recent survey shows over 70% of people support making ecocide a crime. While the technicalities are now up to the ICC, it's important to act before the damage to the planet is irreversible. It's been a difficult year for Elon Musk. Tesla stocks were down. X failed to attract advertisers. He challenged a world leader to a fight. He got into a squabble with a Supreme Court judge and lost a key market. But not all is lost. There is some very good news for Elon Musk. He could be the world's first trillionaire by 2027. Although he won't be alone in the club for too long, by 2028, Indian businessman Gautam Adani could join him. Who else is on this list? And why did some top billionaires not make it? Our next report tells you. On September 29, 1916, the world got its first billionaire. It was John D. Rockefeller, the founder of America's Standard Oil Company. This was a huge deal for the world. Being a billionaire was seen as an unreachable milestone. Over a hundred years later, the world has 2,781 billionaires, and in three years, it could have its first trillionaire. Who will it be? A new report says it's Elon Musk. He's on track to become the world's first trillionaire. Now, the Tesla CEO is already the world's richest man. 
He has a net worth of $251 billion. So how will he breach the trillion dollar mark? Well, the estimate is based on the current growth rate of his wealth. Right now, Elon Musk's wealth is growing at an annual rate of 110%. If that continues, he will be a trillionaire by 2027. But he's not alone. In 2028, he will be joined by Gautam Adani. Right now, his wealth is growing at an annual rate of 123%. If that continues, the Indian businessman will be the second richest person in this club. Third on the list is Jensen Huang. That's the CEO of AI chipmaker NVIDIA. He's seen his wealth go from $3 billion to $90 billion in just five years. The fourth person is Prajogo Prangestu. He's an Indonesian energy and mining mogul. Rounding up the top five is Bernard Arnold. He's the CEO of luxury goods group LVMH. Currently, he's the world's third richest person. He will make it to the trillionaire club by 2030. So will Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg. Nike's former CEO Phil Knight will also enter the club that year. Reliance chairman Mukesh Ambani will achieve the same status in 2033. He is currently Asia's richest man. The CEO of Dell, Michael Dell, will also enter the club by 2033. Former Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer will do it by 2034. So it looks like the world will have 10 trillionaires in the next 10 years. But there are some big names missing. For example, Jeff Bezos. He is currently the world's second richest man. He has a net worth of $200 billion. Yet, Bezos won't become a trillionaire until 2036. SpaceX and Elon Musk. Now, of course, all of this is a prediction. It's not certain. Take Elon Musk, for example. In 2021, he was worth $340 billion. Today, he's worth far less. So, it truly depends on markets and stock fluctuations. But, if the current predictions hold true, over a century after it got its first billionaire, the world will welcome its first trillionaire. Some tools are both important and dangerous. Take knives, for example. They're useful, but they can be dangerous, especially for children. So if you want to protect your child, will you ban knives altogether? Or just redesign them? Say, plastic knives in fun colors, so the child can still use them and learn how to do it safely? Well, this is a rhetorical question. But replace a knife with another tool, and somehow the answer doesn't seem as obvious. Take social media, for example. It's quite useful for children. It can be educational and entertaining, but it is also dangerous. It can lead to mental health issues, poor body image, eating disorders, online harassment, and so on. So what are governments doing about it? Frankly, they're at a loss. But they feel compelled to act. So they're going for knee-jerk reactions. They are restricting, even banning children from social media. The latest to try this is Australia. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has announced a plan. He wants to ban children from social media. The minimum age has not been decided yet, but it could be up to 16 years. And Australia is not alone here. Russia, France and Denmark are mulling a similar ban. Now, there are three problems with this. First, how does the government define the use of social media? Does it include watching a maths video on YouTube? Or using WhatsApp to message friends? Secondly, is it okay to ban children from social media? Who decides if children have the right to be online? Who gets to decide that? And thirdly, like most social media regulations, banning children will be easier said than done. For instance, how will governments know the age of the user? When you create an account, social media platforms ask for your age. But it's very easy to bypass this step. You can use a parent's account or lie about your age. So some countries have tried, have tried with their own age verifications. But no system is perfect. The UK allowed banks or mobile providers 
to confirm if a user is over 18. But they stopped doing this in 2019 because there were too many delays and technical difficulties. In some parts of the US, age was verified as well, like in Utah and Louisiana. But soon after this happened, in Utah, private networks saw a 1,000% increase in use and a threefold increase in Louisiana. So it's not as simple as that. It is not easy to verify age on social media. And if children do get banned, we know what will happen next. They will find their social media elsewhere, on new online places that are less regulated, more risky. And yet again, the burden of responsibility will fall on the parents. They will have to keep a check on what their children do online. And that is rarely a pleasant experience for either party. So what is the solution? Not excluding children, but making social media a safer place. Some countries have these regulations in place. Like in India, platforms must have parental controls. In the EU, tech giants must limit children's access to harmful content. The US has proposed a similar law. Now, tech firms are catching up as well. YouTube restricts teen access to videos of eating disorders or violence. And now it will limit fitness videos. Basically, children will still be able to view them but YouTube itself won't recommend them. This is a step in the right direction, but such policies are still a drop in the digital ocean. Children need more guardrails, like default private profiles, limited interactions with strangers, stronger content warnings, or reporting features. Children also need more awareness. They need to learn how to navigate social media safely. What they don't need is exclusion. Taking kids out of the equation does not do much, except distract the adults from the real problem here, which is this. We still don't know how to redesign the knife. So we are punishing the children for our failing. Sometimes two things seem to be made for each other, like Oprah Winfrey and book recommendations, or Donald Trump and criminal cases. Another example is Saturn and its rings. When you think of the planet Saturn, you probably picture it with rings around it. Saturn's rings are one of the most iconic features in the solar system. But what if we told you that the rings will soon disappear, within a few months actually, in 2025? Why will this happen? Why does it matter? And what are Saturn's rings made of? Our next report tells you. This is Saturn, and it's famous for two reasons. One, it is a gas giant. It is the lightest planet in our solar system. And second, it has these iconic rings. When you think of Saturn, you can't really picture it without them. There are seven main rings that we know of and they are an icy burial zone. Not for aliens, but for crushed comets, asteroids and moons. These rings are vast. They extend over 281,000 kilometers. But compared to the planet's size, they are paper thin. Their height is typically only about 10 meters and they're relatively young. Saturn is a 4.5 billion year old planet, but the rings formed only about 400 million years ago. And when did humans first find out about them? Well, in 1610, when these rings were first observed by the famous astronomer Galileo. That may have been a long time ago, but stargazers today have only about six months to catch a sight of these hoops, because they are set to disappear in 2025. We aren't making this up. NASA has confirmed this. So why are they so calm about it? Because this disappearing act is not apocalyptic. It's simply a Saturning point in planetary alignment, pardon the pun. It's a matter of simple physics. Here's how. Both Earth and Saturn travel around the Sun, but on their respective orbital paths and at a different tilt. So Saturn is not in perfect alignment with Earth. Last year, it was tilted at a 9-degree angle, so we had a really good view of the rings. This year, the tilt is decreasing to an angle of about 3.7 degrees. So, it's getting harder to spot the rings. By next year, in March, the degree will reduce further. The rings will appear side to side with Earth, so they will completely vanish from view. Basically, the rings will technically not disappear, but we won't be able to see them due to an optical illusion. 
And this isn't the first time. This phenomenon occurs like clockwork roughly every 13 to 16 years. Scientists caught it in 1995. Just before the rings disappeared, this is how thin they looked. Again, the phenomenon took place in 2009. And now, it's due to happen in March next year. Many call this phenomenon the Saturn Ring Plane Crossing Day. As wordy as the name is, the phase is important for us. It's a rare opportunity to learn more about the planet. Devoid of its rings, we can get a good look at the planet. And just because we can't view the rings doesn't mean we can't learn more about them. Saturn has 146 moons, the most in the solar system. Astronomers discovered at least 13 of them during ring plane crossings, including the famous Titan, Enceladus and Mimas, also known as the Death Star. So for scientists, this disappearance is a stroke of cosmic luck, even if they can't see it. We've done the critical analysis of Apple's new iPhone, the features, the AI bet, and the drawbacks. But the internet is not really concerned about any of that. They have just one question. What does it look like? Does it look fancier than previous models? As we said earlier, it doesn't. The iPhone 16 looks very much like the 15 and the 14. You could probably use them for a game of spot the difference. I guess Apple is following the old saying in business, if it ain't broke, Release it again for seven years in a row. Having said that, the 16 has updated a key part of its packaging, and that is the price tag. You can now pay more for the same features. Different, but still say. And now it's time for Vantage Shots images that tell the story. SpaceX launches a billionaire and his crew for a private spacewalk mission. Pope Francis leads an open-air mass in the island of Timor-Leste. And helicopters battle a fast-spreading wildfire in California. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 2008. The CERN Large Hadron Collider conducted its first test. It is the world's most powerful particle acceler accelerator located in a 27-kilometer-long circular tunnel under the French-Swiss border. In 2010, it successfully recreated a mini Big Bang. Some call it history's biggest science experiment. We're leaving you on that note. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Two minutes into flight, everything continues to look good.